Hi everyone. Hi everyone, this is a video on phase transitions and diagrams. Here we're going to be spending a little bit of time. Come on. There we go. Pulling in some information on liquids and solids. So, so far for this unit, we have looked at the properties of a liquid, we've looked at the properties of solids. Now we're going to be focusing on how you go between those two phases. And so we're going to be dealing with phase changes and then some phase diagrams. So phase changes you guys are probably familiar with. You know that a gas can change to a liquid, a liquid can go to a solid. And so I just kind of wanted to point out a few of these. And so um, primarily that is going to be um, the ones that I think you might be less uh, comfortable with. And that has to do with the solid to a gas, which is sublimation, and also the and also the uh, gas to a solid, which is usually called deposition. Um, and so melting and bo freezing, boiling and condensation, I feel like you guys are going to be pretty comfortable with those. And I do want to point out one thing, um, freezing and melting, these both occur at the same temperature. And so when we say freezing point, when we say melting point, those two things are used interchangeably. You can't just say freezing point, you can't just say melting point, you have to be aware that those two terms are actually interchangeable and you could hear one when it's you know the same. And that's because at the freezing point you have liquid and solid. At the melting point you have solid and liquid. It's the same point. Um, it's just a direction of flow is all that it is. Now as we move forward we have to consider not only the effect on temperature but also the effect of pressure. Now if you go back I know that you guys are aware if you add heat energy um, you're going to go from solid to a liquid or a liquid to a gas. You add heat to water on the stove it boils it turns into the gas phase. If you add heat to a piece of ice it turns into the liquid. So adding heat you go in this direction. When you lose heat, you're going to go from gas to a liquid, condensation on a mirror, or liquid to a solid where you freeze. The heat leaves that liquid and goes somewhere else. Now we can also discuss this pressure though. Now a lot of the time if you have a liquid versus a solid, a liquid has, it's usually a little bit less dense. Um, a solid is usually the most dense of the phases. Now that's not the case for water. So I'm saying usually here. Now if solid is the most dense phase, then adding pressure is going to usually lower boiling point. And so if we look at this graph, where is my pointer? There it is. Let's go with laser pointer this time. Here, really uh, low pressure and it's got a boiling point of, you know, I don't know, what is that, like 10? Um, adding pressure. Now all of a sudden the boiling point's gone up to about 18. Same thing over here. Sometimes there's less of an effect if you, um, and sometimes there's more of an effect. Here you have a pretty big difference in pressure but only a small difference in you know freezing point. Here a small difference in pressure and you've got a huge change in boiling point. And so it really has to do with how dense, how, how much more dense the solid is as well as those intermolecular forces that are present. Okay. Oh, one more thing. Now technically water is going to have a more dense solid phase than a gas phase. I, I'm sorry. Oh wow. Wow. No. Water is going to have a more dense 
liquid phase than a solid phase. The ice, if you make ice the old fashioned way, the ice actually rises in the ice cube tray. And so you usually don't fill it all the way up because then you have a mess on your hands. Um, if you've ever accidentally frozen a uh, soda or something in the, in the freezer, sometimes those explode because it expanded. The solid is less dense. Now, with that in mind, you can still move, uh, affect the boiling point by adding pressure, but it's usually going to be, um, it's just something I want you guys to be aware of as we move forward. Now, the great thing about energy is it doesn't matter if you do things in one step or in two. So here we go from solid to a gas in one step of sublimation. That it takes the same amount of energy to go from solid to a gas if you do it in one step or in two steps, fusion or melting, vaporization, liquid to gas. Um, one step or two, it's gonna have the exact same energetic requirements, guys. Now, as you're looking at a heating and cooling curve, you actually do this um, in a few labs this semester. And so it's kind of important to know what you're looking at. Now, if you have ice, ice usually in the standard freezer, home freezer, is about negative 20. Um, on the other hand, you can get freezers, especially for research, that can go down to like minus 80. Uh, those are the ones that we typically used the most in, in lab. Um, and it's because it provides less molecular motion. The samples go bad at a much slower rate, so it was worth the money. Now, um, when you heat or cool solid, it's still solid. The only thing that's changing, you add in heat, the only thing that's changing is the temperature, the molecular motion is going to increase a little bit. It's a vibration, not motion. Um, once you get to the melting point, if you continue to put in heat at the melting point, the temperature does not change. It's flat here. It is flat because the heat that is being added is being used to convert between solid and liquid. It is not heating it up until after it is completely in the liquid phase. So when you guys do a heating curve in lab, you're going to watch something, um, the temperature go down for that colligative properties lab. You will know it is freezing when the temperature is constant. Okay, that's how you know. Now, if you're not stirring, you're not really going to get a good result. But the point is, if the temperature is constant, you have a change of phase going. Only once all the solid is melted will adding heat raise the temperature of the liquid. It will continue to do that until you get to the, ga the boiling point. At the boiling point, you are going to start converting between liquid to gas. Adding heat is going to slowly cause the liquid to evaporate or boil, either way. Only once all of the liquid is evaporated will adding heat raise the temperature. Now, we could actually talk in detail about how much energy does it take to convert a specific amount of something from water to a liquid to a solid or solid to a liquid um, or liquid to a gas. And now I'm not going to ask you to memorize that because that would be cruel. Um, instead, what I'm going to do is I could ask you a question. No, I don't want to do that. Like this. Here you order an eight ounce glass of tea where the mass of water is 25 grams. The tea is really kind of warm. That's like bath water, you know. And so you want to add ice to cool it. How much ice do you need? Now, I'm going to give you the information you need to truly answer this. But the idea behind it is you have to consider how much energy is it going to take to get the liquid tea 
down to zero degrees Celsius, down to that freezing point. And then from there, how much, how many ice cubes are you going to need to put in that much energy? Okay, so the way that I would set this up is by looking first at the energy needed to cool the water. If you think back to unit uh, to 111, Q is equal to MC delta T. So we have 250 grams of T. We want to go from 34 down to 0 degrees Celsius and we consider the specific heat of the, the T. That tells us how much energy we need. I'm not doing sig figs here at the moment, okay? Um, but if we did, we would need two. So it would be like 36,000. Um, once you know the amount of energy needed, you can look at how much, how many moles are needed to multiply by that heat of fusion. And you can just plug in the energy, plug in the heat that's given. It'll tell you the moles of ice. Once you know the moles of ice, there's one mole per ice cube because that's what we set up here. So you need about six ice cubes. Why is this not? There it goes. Now in terms of a phase diagram, phase diagrams are another way of looking at what phase is present under each set of conditions. So we can actually have something like this where we have the sublimation point, the deposition point, depending on if you're going from solid to a gas, gas to a solid. Um, remember, pressure is always going to be up here, temperature is going to be down here. You also have the vaporization or condensation points and the melting or freezing point. And so when you read this, solid is always on the left, then liquid, then gas. Now we also have the triple point, which is where you have solid, liquid, and gas existing simultaneously at a specific pressure and temperature. That's the only time that happens. And then you have the critical point. After that, you have a supercritical fluid where there's not really a divide between liquid and gas. It's more of a, um, well, it's a supercritical fluid. Now, if you look, guys, this is usually how, uh, how it looks with the line pointing towards the right between the melting and freezing. For water, it goes in the opposite direction. And it is just a matter of the way that the density works, the way that things come together. It's still going to be solid, liquid, gas. You still have your triple point and your critical point. The only difference is the way that this uh, line points. Now, if you wanted to interpret these, Okay, so as we interpret these, what you have to remember is that there's a solid over here, liquid, gas, and then you have this supercritical fluid. And if you kind of think about, there it goes, um, those phase transitions way back up here, we have gas going to solid through sublimation, gas going to liquid through boiling, um, or liquid going to gas through boiling or condensation. Um, the point is you can see these phase transitions here. And so if you have a solid going to a liquid, that is melting. Liquid going back to a solid, that's freezing. So this line represents the melting or freezing point. Uh, and that is at any t pressure and you can kind of go over and see what that boiling point or melting point is. Same thing for the boiling point. The, phase between liquid and gas, you can, under any given pressure, you can come over and really see um, what the, 
what what the boiling point is going to be um, or condensation point if you prefer that but the idea is you can interpret this because we have a given set of pressures a given set of temperatures for each substance and honestly the easiest thing for me to do is to kind of go over given a pressure go over with like a ruler or a piece of paper and then come down to get to the temperature so for example if we're given a um, thing, a, a, di a diagram like this on a question, and I think this looks pretty similar to what you have on your sample questions, what you'll end up doing is you'll see um, the pressure, the temperature, and you'll get some portion of numbers. And the idea here would be, okay, well, what is the let me see if I can insert a shape here. What is the boiling point at 40, um, whatever units of pressure this is, okay? And so um, with that in mind, let's go ahead and show you how I would do it. Fill, no fill. Let's go with black. And I really like this to be kind of thicker. There we go. Now, if I knew I was looking for a pressure, um, a boiling point at pressure like 40, is that what I said, 40? So you can kind of go over, and this is solid, liquid, gas. So if we're looking for boiling point, we want the point between liquid and gas here. And so I'm going to line this shape up so that just like my edge of paper, on, you know, it would hit this line. And then I'm going to come down and be like, oh, well, that's right around apparently nine, I guess. And so you would look for, you know, the boiling point of nine. The other thing we could do is I could say, well, what phase of matter exists at 50, a pressure of 50 and a temperature of uh, three. And so we would go, okay, 50, pressure, temperature of three. I'm in the solid state here. On the other hand, if it was a pressure of 50 and something like, um, I don't know, 15, all of a sudden we're in the gas phase because this is the gas phase over here. Okay, so as we're kind of dealing with this, just keep in mind, those are the ways that you can really interpret this. Now, if we go into uh, what else we've been doing, I just kind of want to remind you, as we've gone through this unit, we've talked about those phases of matter, we've looked at how those intermolecular forces um, work and how we've looked at how organic structures and other structures indicate what intermolecular forces are present. And then we've really looked at the properties of a liquid, we've looked at the properties of a solid, we've talked about the solid unit cells, we've talked about uh, tr phase transitions, kind of reviewing that 111 principle. And then we've used phase diagrams to really look at what phase of matter is present at in, under certain conditions. Okay, so that is really where we are with this unit. Hopefully, um, it's kind of tying together for the moment.